Okay, we're official. We are recording. Um, my name Hi. is Spencer, and I'm here at the Department of Higher Ed, and I'm joined with joined by Logna. Hi. We are happy to welcome you to Open Education Week Day Two. We have a fantastic presentation from some of our grantees, whom we are very proud of, um, here in the state of Colorado. We administer an OER grant program out of the Department of Higher Ed, and so this is a great showcase of some of the work that's that's um, kind of a, a result of the investment of these dollars. So we are, um, again, like I said, uh, before we get to introducing our speakers, we wanted to make a few announcements. Um, don't forget to enter our meme contest. We have an ongoing meme contest for Open Education Week. We also have other activities ongoing at several different campuses. So please join us if you can. And um, if you want to find out where that information is, it's on our site. We'll send that through on the chat so you can take a look. We currently have a call out for proposals for the OER conference, which is going to be held in Golden in, on June 4th and 5th of this year. So please join us for that or RSVP for the event. And we did like, we'd like to remind you to participate in the governor's zero textbook cost challenge. The governor has issued a challenge to the state of Colorado for institutions to participate at any level and also to be recognized for their zero textbook cost efforts and their OER efforts. So join us in that journey. So now that we've had all those um, disclaimers and introductions, I would like to introduce our speakers for the day, um, Holly and Brittany. And so I'm going to go ahead and read their bios and then I'll kick it over to them. And anything I leave out, you all are more than welcome to share. Um, but I will start with introducing Holly, um, who is at the University of Colorado Denver and has worked in various capacities for the Pikes Peak Library District since 20 since 2007. Currently, she's winding down on a successful nine-month collections project with the Auraria Library, the only tri-institutional academic library in the nation, which is really cool. I knew we were the only tri-institutional academic library in the state, but I didn't know we were the only in the nation, um, which serves, of course, Community College of Denver, MSU Denver, and University of Colorado Denver. Uh, Holly's OER journey began with employment, um, with employment with this Colorado Community College's online system, where she has helped in curating OER for GT courses, serves as an open education ambassador. Woohoo, shout out to the open education ambassadors here in the state of Colorado, and is actively engaged in collaborative OER events. She holds a master's in library science from Emporia State University, and currently, and is currently in a PhD IO psychology student at Walden University where she's turned her focus from researching various models of homeless initiatives taking place in public library systems. Fascinating, I would love to learn more yeah. at some point. So welcome, Holly. Thank you. Holly is joined by Brittany. Brittany Dudek has her MLIS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and has developed OER and ZTC courses as an adjunct faculty member and has also assisted with the CCC Online, uh, has also assisted in CCC Online taking more than 80 courses ZTC in the last few years. She's an open ed research fellow, serves on the exec, exec council of CCC OER, another national group, and on the ACRL CJCLS OER task force. That's a lot of acronyms. So many acronyms. <laughs> um, and also works with the Doers 3 equity work group and is most honored to be the chair of the Colorado OER Council. And we're honored to work with Brittany on a very regular basis. So all that said, thank you all for taking your time and, and um, in encouraging us with your presentation. I will kick it over to you all. And I think Holly, you can go ahead and share your screen now. All right. Thank you everyone for coming, we really appreciate it. Um, we're here today to talk about um, the first grant project that CCCS um, through CCC Online received in 2018, 2019, um, a grant project called Colorado's Top 40. And um, it's a curation project um, of sorts and we're really excited about it and the potential impact it can have as well as the use of um, the use that folks can have across the state and across um, the nation. So a little bit about CCCS. 
Um, CCCS is uh, made up of 14, uh, 13 colleges and has over 40 locations in the state of Colorado. We serve over 120,000 students and in the 1819 year, we had over 22,000 credentials awarded, so certificates. Hey Brittany, let me just jump in real quick. Um, mm -hmm. We are not seeing your screen. Oh. I went ahead and made Holly the, the presenter. So Holly, let's see if you can maybe change the yeah. screen that you're sharing. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, and it might just be um, the little, um, nope, the little blue. Yeah. Try it again. We'll just start sharing again. How about there now? we go? There we go. Okay. All right, you're up. Okay, there we go. No worries. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so CCC Online is a department within CCCS. Uh, we're a consortium of sorts uh, made up of the CCCS colleges as well as Dawson Community College in Montana. We offer some or all of the online courses um, to some or all of those institutions. It kind of depends on which institution. We had just over 48,000 enrollments in academic year 19. We offer 229 courses and we are a quality matters institution. Um, we also offer our courses in three different parts of term. So we have a 15 week course, a 10 week course, and a six week course. We have just under 500 instructors. CCC Online has been working in zero textbook cost space since uh, 2011 when we launched our first course. Um, we've kind of played around in that space on and off, um, slowly increasing the number of courses that we offer by you know, up to six, then maybe 10, 11, 12, things like that. Um, but it wasn't until summer of 2017 that we really started formalizing our processes, um, including um, counting um, enrollments and the cost savings to courses, um, coming up with some really great templates um, and you know things like that. So here we have um, the cost savings to students from 2017 to current, um, which we've totaled up at just over $2.3 million, uh, serving 34% of CCC Online students. We're really proud of this number because it is, as you can see, a really exact number. Um, we don't count our courses that were developed originally as OER, or if we can't track the original cost of the textbook. Um, so courses like English Comp, for example, are not included in this number. Um, also, we do have a inclusive access, inclusive access-esque model for the rest of our courses. So we are able to grab a very specific um, textbook cost that we were able to eliminate. And so we're really proud of serving over 45,000 students in just over two academic years in our zero textbook cost courses. So why Colorado top 40 for our OER project? Um, first, as I mentioned, we do have over 80 zero textbook cost courses. Um, and that means that we've done a lot of things good and we've also done a lot of things bad. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons throughout the way. And we know that if you decide to go OER or go zero textbook cost, it takes a lot of resources, uh, resources on the, um, the instructor, the librarians, um, instructional designers, academic technology, the support staff, administration, um, and we wanted to um, do something that would help folks with the first step. Um, we also wanted to take advantage of Colorado's CCNS, which is our common course numbering system, and our guaranteed transfer pathway infrastructure. Um, and Holly will talk a lot more about those in just a little bit. Um, but the structure of our CCNS, or our Common Course Numbering System, um, provides a common um, structural outline um, and competencies for our courses. Um, and that, coupled with the CCC Online ability to scale our courses, um, made this project something that was really exciting for us. Um, so we wanted to lean into our strengths, which is our ability to scale out our work. Um, and provide something that can be used by folks across the state or across the country. So a little bit more about Colorado Top 40. Um, when we looked at the enrollment of the top 40 courses by enrollment at CCCS, tops out at about 166,000 students annually. Um, so what we did was we took uh, a look at the guaranteed transfer courses um, and looked at them by enrollment across all of our colleges and we came up with the top 40 courses um, 
why we have the catchy name. And we decided we wanted to curate the available open educational resource content for those courses um, to provide a curation guide, which is what we do for our in-house uh, work to instructors um, and librarians and instructional designers um, who may be interested in exploring OER, but don't really have the resource infrastructure in place to, um, to start the process themselves. Um, our project team was uh, one instructional designer who created a template um, that aligned the resources as well as the uh, common topical outlines and structural outlines for the competencies for each course. Um, and then we also worked with four librarians who went and spent a really long time um, doing research to find the available OER. They then aligned the content and put it into that template the instructional designer made. Um, and now we're in the last phase, which is working with 40 instructors um, who serve as subject matter experts. Uh, so they have a master's plus 18 credits in the field that they're teaching. Um, and they are currently in the process of evaluating the curation guides that we've made. Um, and once they're finished with them, we'll um, go through, give them some, some love, make sure that they're, they're neat and orderly, and then we will post them for consumption. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Holly now, and she's going to talk about the actual process that we did. All right. So my job, I was hired specifically to go in and find OER objects that aligned to uh, the, the course outcomes and the topic outlines that were found in the Common Course Numbering System, which was new to me. So I had to navigate that as well as um, navigate this whole new world of OER, which was rather new to me when I started the project and not new to me when I finished. <laughs> um, but when I met Brittany, uh, I really didn't know a whole lot about OER. And um, so uh, she started me off with some little tips and tricks. And, um, and uh, so, I think that uh, it, the, the whole journey has been very collaborative uh, as far as, you know, um, the librarians getting together and, um, and, you know, just being sort of directed by Brittany as far as what we need to go in and find. Um, and that for me was the easy part because I'm not an educator. So having this, this common course numbering system was a, a good guide for me to follow to know exactly what I had to go in and search for. So here's an example of one of the courses that I did. It was uh, a Calculus One course. I did quite a few of the Calculus courses. And, uh, and so I, this is the top part of the page found on a CCNS. And I would go in, and this would just show the metadata and uh, a brief description, as well as an attached syllabus that would be included uh, within the template uh, as a PDF attachment. Further down the page, it would uh, explain the different course learning outcomes, which was huge for me, just in order to get a really broad idea of, of uh, what the, the course was, what students were expected to learn. And so this was a go-to for me consistently to make sure that I was staying within the scope of, of, of the course. Um, then further down on the CCNS page, uh, it will show the required topical outline, and if there is a recommended topical outline, that will be included as well. And we did focus on the, the required topical outline, uh, keeping the scope in mind, and then uh, personally, I would go in when I finished my required, I would go into the recommended topical outline and uh, supplement with those bullets. And usually, I could find uh, the objects in the, top, the recommended topical outline somewhere embedded in the modules and chapters of the required. And again, here, we really just focused uh, heavily on the required topic outline. Uh, and I, I try and describe it as a little bit where those red arrows are pointing. There was kind of a little bibliography built for each one of those bullets. So um, Brittany kind of guided us as far as uh, when we go in to look for objects, OER objects, that we wanted to keep uh, learning styles in mind. We wanted to make sure that uh, 
uh, our objects were accessible, that they had closed captions, that there were errors or dead links, things like that. So um, we'd end up coming up with a few objects for each one of the bullets that are shown. So like I said, a little bit of a bibliography for each sub topic and, and subtopic. And so yeah, we would just go in and, and find quality OER for each one of these. So what did we define as quality? Uh, well, online and, and throughout the web, there's uh, lots of discussions about what, what defines quality. We talk about it in our conferences. And, uh, but these are three that I focus on, was told that these were uh, in, important in, in my focus of work, is with accessibility, making sure that the objects were um, coded correctly, that they had the right captions, um, that they were, they were designed for ad adaptive technologies and that they could be read um, easily and navigated easily with those type of technologies. Um, make sure that we were free of copyright content. I didn't want to pass any objects on to educators um, unless they were uh, creative commonly licensed. So uh, that's the whole point. That was the whole point of of the, of the project. So um, really, it, and they can sneak in there, as I'll show you later. Um, copyright content can easily sneak in to uh, what you may think is created commonly licensed um, objects. And then reviews, uh, which were hugely uh, important for me for as a, not a subject specialist in any one of these areas that I was searching. Uh, the reviews came into were very important uh, in, in the process of my curation because for me that was uh, having other educators that were specialists in that field um, telling me that this was a this was good content was a, a good for good foot for me to, to start off on. Uh, so mentioned earlier was this accessibility. Uh, the WAVE accessibility tool was one that I used. Uh, Brittany had brought it up too, and that uh, I learned about this in the coding class. And it was actually hounded into us at the very beginning at how accessible our, our pages had to be when we were coding. And I don't know if that was my teacher or not, but it was a, <laughs> it's, it's proved to be very valuable uh, in, the, in the course of this project, as you'll see. But essentially what you do with the WAVE is you take a URL and you just plug it in and it will um, generate results of errors and um, features that are within that page, as I'll show you here. So this is just kind of a quick example. There's three little snapshots. Uh, Wave is a, a huge tool. It would take a whole PowerPoint, a whole presentation just to talk about Wave, but I'll do what I can here. Um, <clears throat> so on the left-hand side, we've, it, uh, we have the, the mention of structural elements, which are just really important when, when they're coding for these uh, web pages for adaptive technologies. And um, the middle picture there is just a summarization of uh, really what the, the tool looks at. So we have features, structural elements, and then ARIA landmarks, which are, uh, are all features that are wanted when, when coding and, and are important for uh, adaptive devices. Uh, but then you need to keep an eye on the alerts, the errors, and contrast errors. Uh, so over to the right is actually a different page that I had run through that showed quite a few errors, which can be very, very common. Um, but as you can see, this URL um, came from an open, open text, the BC, which usually runs uh, a lot of press books. So, and Pressbooks has actually taken a lot of the um, OpenStax uh, resources, uh, textbooks, and made them so that they are more friendly to, um, they've edited the, the, the content in that way, so that it is more friendly. And um, so here's just another quick snapshot, just an example of what, the, of what Wave likes. Heading levels are great because they show, as over to the left, um, how do you facilitate page navigation for users of assistive technology? So it tells the, um, the device where to go. And um, just it's just as important as having the, the text underneath the images so that uh, individuals, users know what's inside of those images. 
Um, and just another example, unordered lists are considered a feature. They're very good because they help with the navigation of, of the page. <clears throat> and this is a um, web aim, I think uh, the, the earlier screen, it's uh, webaim.org. And we'll be saving this presentation. Okay. So organizing resources uh, was hugely important. Organizing, staying organized within this entire project from, from the very beginning was extremely important. From the template to the thought process to knowing exactly what my job was and knowing that you know when I went in to go and find OER that uh, I had a place to organize those things so that they would be visually uh, you know, uh, ready for the next process. So um, <clears throat> CC Online provided me us with a template so uh, with the fields already pre-made so we would just input our objects um, with uh, the resource citation so we would uh, do our best to uh, attribute and cite according to the discipline that we were working within and um, and then we would provide the link and sometimes we'd have to use a tiny URL or a bitly URL which Twitter uses just to get the, um, those links in, to fit into the, the fields because uh, when you go, sometimes when you go to copy those links, they can be extremely long. So the, the bit.ly's uh, are, and the tiny URLs are, are helpful for shortening those links and getting them to fit in tight spaces. Uh, and then we would um, list the license type and uh, which was sometimes not always easy to find not always uh, did they have a visible uh, icon that showed me which type of license was being used. Sometimes you have to get in there and really dig into the terms and use your control F to search uh, keywords and to, to search for that one sentence that tells you this, uh, we're letting you use this content under a Creative Commons license. Uh, but not always is it displayed on that first page in the footer or anywhere. So sometimes you gotta dig, especially if it's a, an object that you'd really like to use. And then um, that as uh, the last screen on uh, the, uh, the OER guide was designed as a CCBY. So um, just attributions and I could modify it. So I went in and kind of just uh, as an example, just showed you know that through a Google Doc, how, you, how um, uh, everybody can make their own template and adapt it to whatever their situation is institutionally. Um, here, I, I took the exact same guide and all I did was just, I added two extra columns. I threw in a format type and then a note. So if I wanted to do uh, notes to an instructor or a notes to a peer reviewer or to the next person that's in that stage of review, um, I could you know get a little bit more specific. So you can see how the topics are, um, set here with headings and then the subtopics in between. But this is just another example too of you know how the adaptation and how you know having a, a guide built by someone else that's that's licensed in a way that I could go in and make it mine um, for for future use and then someone else can go in and, and adapt that in the way that they like. So um, really great. And then searching for OER, it should be easy, right? <laughs> and it can be, it's very fun for somebody who loves to get in there and, and, um, and get into the nitty gritty of researching and, and um, finding OER. Um, but there, it came definitely with a, some frustrations. I think in Dr. Rajiv's uh, webinar yesterday, uh, there were some people who had commented on um, that is where some frustration does come from and um, actually knowing where to start. So um, I, I had to start in just knowing the difference between MOOCs and, and digital repositories. Uh, MOOCs being massive online courses, uh, Lumen, MIT, uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And then the repositories, uh, we'll show, I'll show uh, the, the George Mason Metadata Finder and um, Merlot and some of those really great great repositories, but knowing the difference can um, help you kind of di differentiate between 
the pathway that you will and will not take to get to, to your OER objects. Because when they are in repositories, they, I, my experience was I, they were definitely user friendly. Where in the, the, uh, the MOOCs, the, OER, the OER is in there, but it might not be as easy to get to. So Brittany uh, thankfully shared some of her tips and tricks when I started this project and I was able to build on those. And I'll share some of that with you now. Um, MIT, uh, kind of the, the um, cornerstone of the whole OER MOOC movement. Um, I would use this website quite frequently. This is a MOOC. And um, they, are, they have a lot of really great video lectures and PDF content, exercises, things like that. Um, I did a screenshot there of um, some of the most visited courses, which was great for me because calculus was included within the top six. Uh, and I, I did I utilize some of the video objects uh, in, in my curation. And for the sole reason of um, finding a video that is 45 to 50 minutes long, um, had me you know, asking, is anybody really going to use this? Um, is this going to be valuable to someone? But if I didn't include it, then how, how am I going to introduce an educator to MIT OpenCourseWare? So just giving them that pathway to find a MOOC like this um, opens the door of opportunity for them to, to explore and see for themselves what, what a MOOC like this has to offer. So. Um, I loved visiting MIT. <laughs> it was uh, a, 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 a great experience. Um, and then this was something that uh, Brittany kind of showed me in the beginning to Lumen uh, can be a little difficult just to, as, as far as getting in just to find the OER objects themselves. Um, it, it can be uh, a little difficult to navigate uh, when you're on that very first home page. Um, but you can search through courses and there's a, a point where you get to, you can try this course, and um, um, you can try this course, or uh, sorry, or you can view the course um, content. And um, the difference between the two being that to try the course really just takes you to a registration page, um, which is great. You can log in. Um, but if you really just want to get in there and, and see what kind of OER these, these uh, Lumen courses are using within their course modules, then the one at the bottom, the view the course content now comes, is where you, where you want to head. And that is a trick that, had I not learned that from Brittany, I could have spent quite, quite, quite a good deal of time trying to get to those objects. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then YouTube, uh, I know this gets talked about quite frequently now with uh, Creative Commons, but uh, YouTube videos, you know, can be under the assumption that they're just, they're um, copyrighted in a way that uh, anybody can use them, but that's not true. Um, there is a filtering process to find Creative Commons uh, uh, videos, and I always uh, chose the subtitle CC2. Um, to make sure that the videos that uh, I would be resulted with would have those, um, those two aspects of Creative Commons and both subtitles. And it will definitely filter down your results, but um, that's okay. Um, that's why we need creators out there. <laughs> yes. um, and then uh, this is just an example of the OpenStax errata. Um, OpenStax uh, in my findings was the number, pretty much the number one uh, object used for derivative purposes. Uh, a lot of um, derivative works came from OpenStax uh, textbooks and clearly stated and attributed, but um, it, it was definitely a common pattern that I saw and which just kind of reinforces the, the reputation that OpenStax has with their, with their great content. Um, but they also have an OpenStax errata, and you can find that in the instructor's resources on uh, the landing page of any, of any textbook. And what it'll do is, is, is uh, you get a reviewer or somebody going through finds an, a, a, an error, and they can document that. And so it goes through a review process of subject experts, 
and um, and then they display it so that uh, it's it's transparent and everybody can see exactly what's being reviewed and looked at. So just another uh, facet of consideration when um, you know searching for objects that somebody else is going to use in their course. And uh, this is an example of a repository, George Mason uh, Metadata Finder. Uh, huge rabbit hole, but you will get lots and lots and lots of results. Um, it's a dynamic page, which means it is continually, um, it's, it's going to be crawling the web. And so as you see here, uh, it will pop up results as it finds them. And then you can add those uh, to your results and filter down how you need to. Um, I loved this one um, just for the sole purpose of finding um, objects that are just out there, no matter how small or random they may be. Um, and they do link to you know, the, the major repositories as well, like Merlot, as you can see. Um, they also has a, have a visual view, which I, I didn't have a slide for, um, but it's right over here. And, um, and if you click on that, then it just gives you a visual display of, of the same results. And so you can um, filter down that way as well. But um, great resource as a repository, George Mason Metadata Finder. Librarians love metadata. We do. We do. <laughs> it makes our job easy. <laughs> Um, and then I've seen this mentioned um, before, and uh, you know I, I have to admit it, it took me a while before I discovered that Google actually had uh, this this option um, because I was using the books and the repositories to find <clears throat> uh, objects, and um, but Google does have a, a usage right filter, and um, I put over to the right some definitions that Google has provided um, about these particular filters. And I did notice that in my searches that, uh, and this is found through an advanced search. So if you go into search Google, you need to find the advanced search uh, filter and then filter down from there. But what I did find is when I thought maybe I was going in to find an object that was free to use or share, um, uh, the terminology was a little confusing to me, which it actually means it allows you to copy or redistribute um, as long as the content you know, remains um, unchanged. So the terminology is a little bit different, uh, but it, it still does filter out those objects. You just have to go in and check, check the reliability because the copyrighted material does sneak its way in there um, very easily. So uh, again, just you know, verifying that you've got the correct license um, before you pass that on. And finally, I always love to inc uh, include, there's amazing OER guides out there. Uh, there are repositories within repositories. Uh, Ellen Metter, Metter over to Rary has a great one that has all of the repositories and books that I've talked about with, uh, in addition to a lot of others. So, um, <clears throat> but there are a lot of guide, great guides out there. Um, Brittany's breaks down um, uh, uh, just a real understanding of OER and the licensing, what the icons mean, what to look for, why it matters. Um, she talks about copyright and public domain. Um, so to, just these are just two examples of, of, of really great guides that I included um, within the resources of the template because um, I Th these are these are resources that are available for for faculty. So I feel as though you know including things like this, resources like this, is just opening up that door to them to to help them find more more resources in a, in a, a locally locally uh, I don't want to say central <laughs> area. So um, so that's it for that's that was my searching journey and uh, it was a wonderful. I, Amazing experience. <laughs> yeah, we hope you have good luck finding your own learning objects. Um, so we've created these 40 curation guides containing all of this amazing OER. Um, and you might be wondering, what does that mean for me? Um, so I've got a couple of options. Um, first, if you're a faculty member or if you teach, if you're an instructor, if you're an adjunct, if you work with faculty, um, you can take a look at Colorado's top 40 and see if your course is covered by this project. If it is, 
you're welcome to use it. Um, if it's not, we encourage you to look at the CCNS, the Common Course Numbering System, and take a look at those topical outlines. Um, look at courses that are in your discipline um, and see if you can find some similar courses. Um, I know that within Colorado we have, you know, English 121 is English 121 um, within the community college system and within some other institutions as well. Um, but English comp is probably going to be pretty similar um, across institutions and across states. Um, so I would really recommend that you take a look at the CCNS topical outlines in courses that match your name so that you can find similar courses that may be covered by Colorado's top 40. Uh, if that's not going to work for you, then I encourage you to look at some of the interdisciplinary guides, something like writing and research. Every course is going to have some sort of citation required, some sort of writing aspect, whether that's um, you know, a discussion item or a research project. Um, you can tell I work in online education because I think discussions are written. Um, but, you know, if you look at those interdisciplinary guides, um, critical thinking, information literacy, things like that, you're likely going to be able to find parts that you can incorporate into your own course as well. Um, you may not take your full course OER, but by incorporating some resources, you can dip your toes into OER. Um, we encourage you then to adapt the resources that you find to meet your needs, just like with all OER. Now, if you're not a teaching faculty member, if you're an OER advocate, um, a librarian, a instructional designer, um, someone who works in accessibility, um, any other staff member um, who is an OER advocate, we encourage you to create your own top 40. Um, so that might look like whatever your top courses are. That might look like exploring different disciplines. Um, maybe, you know, the top five courses in history, for example, or your core courses um, at your institution. Also, I think every librarian can agree that we have uh, library champions, if you will, <laughs> who are very um, big library supporters. Maybe you create guides surrounding your library champions, um, those faculty members who always show up for your instruction sessions, who always show up for the pizza lunches, um, and who are always sending students to your course. Um, so you can kind of create your own top whatever number you might come up with. Um, you can also look at places like Washington and Georgia. Um, they've created similar lists. Uh, Georgia has a top 100, I think. I think so does Washington. Um, so you can take Georgia, Washington, and Colorado and create your own institution or your own state's top 119 or whatever the overlap is. Um, we also really encourage you to take these top 40s uh, and rebrand them. Um, if you live in Idaho, or if you live in, you know, California, or if you work at a specific institution, you can take our top 40 research guides, our OER guides, and just rebrand them. They're all licensed with Creative Commons, so they can become Idaho's top 40, or, you know, make two extra guides, and now you have the right coverage for your state or for your institution. Um, we really hope that someone will do that. We also hope that you use these curation guides to start your own OER program at your institution. Um, working to take a course OER or zero textbook cost is a lot of work. It's a lot of resources on the part of the faculty member, on the part of the librarian, on the part of the instructional designer, and all of the other staff members um, who help out with the creation of the courses. And we hope that this will kind of help you do that first step of research um, so that way you can move on to the more subject specific or discipline specific topic areas. So you might be asking yourself, um, how do I find these resources? Um, so right now they're currently not anywhere. Um, it's coming soon, I promise. So as Holly mentioned, um, the curation is completed and right now all of the top 40 guides are out at the um, subject matter experts. I've gotten about half of them back already, and I'm in the process of making them, um, you know, putting them in their final formats. Um, so basically, eventually, um, you can go to the cccs.edu slash open educational resources, um, and we'll be putting all of our resources up here on this website. Um, this will be hopefully by the end of the month, um, by the end of March, maybe a little bit sooner. 
Um, it might be, you know, slowly rolling out as March goes on. It just depends when we start getting them back um, from our from our subject matter experts. Um, so I do encourage you to save this page. I'll also start sending it out, and I know Spencer will send it out too through um, the, you know, through Twitter and things like that. Um, but eventually, um, Colorado Community College System Open Educational Resources. So we would um, love to know from you if you have questions, comments, concerns, um, anything that we can help with um, or any way you might see using these resource guides um, or any ideas for us for the future because um, we're always looking for new ideas. Well, first of all, I want to jump, jump in and say thank you very much um, to both Holly and Brittany. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, fantastic to kind of get a deep dive on the technical acumen and dedication that it takes to make this happen. And um, I have two quick questions. While people are queuing up, there are questions. You can send them through the chat or you can pipe up. Um, just turn your microphone back on when you get the moment. I muted everybody for the time being. My first question was, um, just to reiterate, so Brittany, with regard to the number of students that the potential impact and number of students that this project could reach, what was that number again? How many students? So when we looked at academic year 18, when we originally proposed this project, there were 167,000 students enrolled at, in these 40 courses throughout CCCS. Um, that number seems to fluctuate by about 1,000. <laughs> so in academic year 19, there was 166,000 students enrolled across the community college system. Um, so somewhere in there should, you know, of course that would mean that everyone would have to adopt OER for these courses, and we hope that they will. But yeah, that's, large impact there. that's really impressive, especially for the amount of, um, you know, I know that it is an investment on the institution side, but from the state's perspective, from our perspective, this is really the strength of the grant program is to kind of have that compounded impact and then opening it up to beyond the Colorado borders, of course, is something that's uh, magnificent that you mentioned before as well. Um, I know for a fact that your project will be completed and uploaded to the site by at least May 30th. It definitely that, that is the end of the grant cycle. So yes. just for clarification for those who are asking, um, the reason the reason for that timeline is because we have about a year and a half long grant cycle. So the grantees are given about a year and a half to complete these projects and we're everybody in, in Colorado is anxiously awaiting these. So I'm really excited to see that. My other question is a bit more esoteric. And so I wanted to ask you to, so this is a lot of work. Holly, you were going very deep. Um, I think having this technical you know, frame by frame of understanding what it looks like from your perspective, aligning the learning outcomes with the available resources, making sure that they are openly licensed, and then bundling that up to prepare to give to a subject matter expert or review with a subject matter expert is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So my question for both of you is, what motivated you to complete the project? How do you stay motivated? What inspired you? Well, for me, it was nice because I was able to work with people like Holly um, and Amy and Vicki and Victoria um, and Ben, our instructional designer, who all were really excited about this project. Um, not everyone kind of came in with a high level of OER familiarity. Um, so it was really exciting to be able to talk about OER with someone who was somewhere between new and you know introductory level knowledge to OER and to see the possibility of the impact this project had. Um, so that was exciting from my perspective. I also thought that this project, CCC Online has been working in the OER space for a while, and we have been making a great impact for our students. Um, but on a personal note, I, I think I speak for a lot of folks at CCC Online and at CCCS, that we're all really excited and um, empowered by the prospect of being able to help others with the lessons that we've learned because like I said, we've learned a lot. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. Um, and by being able to use our skill set um, and the ability that we have to work at scale, that we can share that with folks inside Colorado and outside of Colorado and hopefully make a difference that goes beyond just the 122,000 students in Colorado in the Colorado Community College system, um, but that really spans the world because English comp is English comp. Um, you know, there may be you know, differences here and there, but students are really learning similar things in these 
high enrollment 100 and 200 level courses. Um, so we really hope that the impact is, is really great. Um, Holly, how about you? You're the one who did a lot of the work. <laughs> well, I just felt like, uh, you know, this was a project for me. This, I was, it was high, I was hired on, um, it was project based. So I was paid a certain amount for the amount of work that I did, but behind the scenes, knowing that, um, what I was picking was going to be used to teach people. Um, that just, that just, uh, that was the most important uh, uh, feature, I think, probably that I just kept remembering is that somebody is looking at this stuff. Somebody's going to evaluate. It's going to go through peer processes and the review processes. But in the end, um, I'm picking these objects so that somebody can teach somebody with them. And if I have roadblocks somewhere, if there's a dead link or the text it can't read the text or somebody's going to be left out. And so, um, you know, there were a lot of them that were tossed that I liked, I really like this, but um, I don't think it's going to fulfill the, the right need. Um, maybe if somebody could go and fix the coding or fix the contrast or do something like that, it would be a better object to use. But for now, I, it doesn't fit. It doesn't, I, I don't have a good feel for it. And I don't think it would, pop, you know, um, go through that review process, but just keeping in mind exactly what it, what it was that we were doing. Um, and I'm not a quitter, so. <laughs> um, Which I I'll, really appreciate. <laughs> if I, you know, I'll, 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 whatever it takes to make it happen, but this was, this was especially important. This was an especially important project and, um, and great experience. I think we're both really proud of. We're all really proud of the work that we've done. Yeah. Yes, and you should be. And I, I do see um, at least one question coming through on the chat from Gunzeb. Oh, yes. um, what tools did you use for curation and planning in addition to the template? So um, we, our instructional designer used uh, Word um, to create a template because we wanted something that anyone could edit. Uh, we had originally started throwing around like using InDesign or some of the Adobe products, but we decided that that would put too many restrictions on the template that we wanted to use um, and make that adaptable to folks. Um, so we stuck with Word um, specifically because the most people have Word, um, and if you don't, you can upload that to maybe Google Docs or OpenOffice, um, and then you'll have the ability to go ahead and edit the template or add to the template or, or things like that. Um, we have a marketing package that we're also working on. Um, our marketing manager is, is getting um, together. Um, so that will be a package that includes some of the rubrics that we've provided to the subject matter experts um, to evaluate the different resources. Um, and we really stood on the shoulders of giants with those, um, you know, looking at SUNY and Georgia and Oregon and Washington and California um, by taking those different rubrics and providing them to our subject matter experts. Um, so that's, those are the resources that they're using. Um, and then the marketing package, like I mentioned, will have tips for, you know, communicating your um, OER program out or your own top 40 program out, um, a survey just so we can see how people are using these resources, if they're using these resources. Um, and then we also are hopeful that we commit to updating these resources um, in the future. So let's say, you know, CALC, which is Math 201, um, we re-curate because we're going zero textbook costs with it in three years. You know, we'll publish the new curation guide. Um, and our hope is that as folks are using these curation guides, that they will then share them also. Um, and so that we'll have kind of this continuous update going on with these different curation guides. Yeah, I found the most important tools were just the organizational tools, the spreadsheet tools. Um, because even if, you know, in a library, say that doesn't, that lacks an instructional designer, or doesn't have that, that staff, you know, that, that can uh, take those resources to the next level, it may just go exactly, you know, right to the person that's using them. So um, just having, you know, a, a organizational tool that works for you is is the best. I love Google Docs a little more than I like Excel. Um, and so, uh, and Control F is my friend. <laughs> yeah, we tried to stay away from the proprietary 
resources as much as possible. And I, I do know that, you know, of course, Office is a proprietary tool, but, um, you know, we kind of tried to make the best decision we could that we thought would help the most number of people. Yeah, if you want to go open source, you can use Libra. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Libra's got some spreadsheets. Question. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions from folks on the phone? I think Lobna maybe has a yeah, question for you. Um, I have a question. So I'm a recent graduate. I just graduated in December. Um, when I talk to my faculty about OER, they always mentioned or they always had this fear that it wasn't high quality. Now you mentioned that there are high quality materials out there in uh, you kind of talked about how we could find them and where to find them, but how do you start the conversation with those faculty um, to say like, yeah, there is actually these high quality materials. I feel like right now, at least in my opinion, all the audience that is here already, um, they already know that OER is a sufficient sufficient materials and they do want to use it and they do believe that it is high quality but how do you start those conversations with faculty who do not believe that sure that's a great question um also congratulations on graduating mm -hmm. um i i like to start those conversations by asking instructors how they're currently evaluating their materials um because oftentimes folks are relying on the fact that something is a publisher material or published under the traditional um, the pr traditional publishing avenue, if you will, uh, to say that it's something that's high quality. Um, and so when you start having that conversation, you know, how did you evaluate this, this item? Did you use a rubric? Did you read it cover to cover? Um, did you do sample questions in every single chapter? Um, did you look at the homework platform and did you try all the homework problems? You know, if you ask people if they're doing that level of evaluation, which is generally the evaluation that OER gets, um, you might, I, I'm often surprised by the response. Um, and so I encourage folks to, to do that, to look at both resources and give them a fair comparison when it comes to evaluating their quality. Um, lots of resources do have peer review um, or reviews available. Um, and that's partially why we wa wanted to make these curation guides um, peer reviewed. So these are reviewed by a subject matter expert or an instructor who has the same qualifications that you might have in your field and they have said that these resources are items that I would consider when I was teaching. Um, and I think that that's really important um, to know that something is some, some object is something that someone else would consider using um, is, is important to people. And I think that's also why we included the accessibility um, column in our curation guides, why Holly went through all the different places where she located OER, where the rest of our librarians located OER, and then also why our marketing kit will have the rubrics that our subject matter experts have used or that folks can use to evaluate resources themselves. Um, because ultimately, the instructor is the subject matter expert the instructor is the content expert, and the instructor is the one who is the person who has to teach. Um, so I think that they should be evaluating the resources that they want to use and making the decision. Um, and I hope that they give OER any form, you know, a textbook or these curation guides. Um, I hope that they give them the same evaluation that they also give the material that they're considering replacing. And I also think that maybe um, when, when a topic like that comes up and someone may state that, there are no qual there aren't quality. Um, they may not know where they are, mm -hmm. and they may not be able to find them as easily because, as we talked about, uh, sometimes they're not as accessible. So, um, the, the the repositories are great for that, uh, but still, you've got to search out. You know what works for your class. As a librarian, I have no idea. You know what all of those you know twenty pages of citations are gonna to mean to the person who's teaching the class. All I know for my job is that I had to go in and find, make sure there were no dead links, that they were fairly you know, peer reviewed, um, that they fit the, um, the accessibility uh, and, and in every way possible, uh, find those quality objects to be passed on. 
and they may only use 1% of those, but that's okay because they, within my, my curating, they found a few resources that they could use. And though there are good, there are quality objects out there. Um, sometimes what I have found and at conferences that I've been to is that educators don't always have the time to go find them. That's where we come in as librarians. <laughs> and that's where that connection can happen is that we're the searchers. And we love to go in and find those objects and bring them to you and show you how to get to them. And, um, and otherwise they, there are nuggets of, you know, little treasures everywhere that will just remain undiscovered. Um, but uh, yeah, evaluation of quality, it's a really, really touchy topic. Yeah, it can be challenging. <laughs> it can be challenging. <laughs> To quote you from your presentation earlier, Holly, uh, librarians love metadata, so we right. need to take advantage of that, right? Yes, it helps us find things. <laughs> Frame that quote. It's a good quote. Yeah, my coffee favorite coffee cup is metadata. I love metadata. Um, but yeah, it helps us find you know um, the more repositories and the more um, the more tools that use metadata help uh, in that searching process, but. Um, you know, in the meantime, you know, uh, we, we've got to get in there and dig. So my suggestion would be if somebody had the, the intuition to maybe do it, ask that instructor, uh, what, what are you looking for? And go find them a few things and let them look and pique their interest. Because if they have that mindset from here on out that, that there aren't any good objects down there, then um, why bother looking? So that's where the connection has to happen. Show them where they are, you know. Great. Well, I know we're, we're getting close to time. Um, if there are any other questions, we'll just pause for a moment to see if anybody else has questions. Not hearing any, thank you again, Holly um, and Brittany very much for your, for your work. Um, and congratulations on nearing the end of the grant program and project. We're really excited to see what you all put out. And thank you everybody else for attending. Again, join our meme contest. Um, Logan just sent through on the chat. Join our other Open Education Week events that are happening. We have an event at Auraria Library tomorrow. Um, and then a couple more presentations to round out the, I'm sorry, the Auraria presentation is on Thursday, right? and a couple more events to round out the week. So um, check out our website for those. And we will see you all soon and catch you on Twitter. We will um, upload this recording and share that out um, as a resource. So thank you again. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.